Well, hello everyone. Um, welcome to the meeting of the CSI BIM practice group on February 17th, 2012. I'm uh, Roger Grant, one of the uh, leaders of the practice group, and I'm joined today by uh, Beth Strochane, who's another one of the practice group leaders, and our presenters for today, who we'll be introducing in a, in a few minutes. Um, but first, we're uh, just going to let you know where we're going today, and uh, and we'll be getting started with our presentation. So uh, um, here's our agenda. Just, there we go. Um, and uh, Bob Wygant, who's usually here with us, couldn't make it today, so he sends his uh, he sends his regrets. Uh, so today we're going to be following up on. Uh, what we started, the theme we started on last month when uh, Beth presented to us about um, about uh, best practices for specification systems, uh, in particular using uh, them in in conjunction with building information modeling. Uh, and I'm going to ask Beth to just give a brief overview of what she talked about last week to kind of set things up for uh, for our guests from eSpecs today. Uh, uh, but first, maybe a few housekeeping items. Um, you're all muted, uh, but we do encourage you to ask questions. Uh, we will take questions as the program goes along uh, and uh, potentially uh, break in uh, a few times and also cover some at the end. You can uh, ask questions either by typing them into the question box and we'll moderate them for you, or if you're anxious to uh, speak, we also encourage that. You can go ahead and uh, just raise your hand using the panel, um, uh, using the GoToMeeting panel, and uh, uh, we can uh, give you the ability to speak uh, there um, that way. So um, that's the, those are the logistics for using the system. And uh, Beth, would you mind just going ahead and summarizing what you talked about last month as uh, this is part of a, a theme that we have going? I'm sure, and welcome everybody. Last month we started off the year with a general summary of some of the software that's on the market and what it talks about it doing and what we've experienced it working with. And now, um, and this is from my point of view is a user that's used all of the all of the software and reviewed all of it. And now we're going to talk to some other super users that we've asked each of the software vendors to provide and tell us where where the high bar is for each of these softwares because I'm going to be the first to admit that I am not the center of the universe and don't know everything about all the software. So after my summary of eSpecs and the features that it has now we're going to talk to um, Jim Kellogg from HOK and have him explain what they've done with eSpecs and where they've kind of set the bar. And then in the future we'll be talking to other super users of other software to see where where they've taken that software. And so listen in and figure out where the future is. And also if you missed last month and want to get a summary of that, you can see it on YouTube if you go to the uh, BIM user group on the uh, CSI's website so that you can see last month and this month in the future so you can get summaries later. So with that, um, we'd like to hear from Jim and Gil about eSpecs and where that software can take us. Oh, great. Thank, thanks, Beth. And I'm glad you pointed out that this is available for anyone that missed last month's uh, session. And um, I would say, you know, um, We've invited uh, uh, eSpecs this month. Uh, we're going to be hearing from some of the other um, guide spec uh, systems in coming months. Next month we have BSD queued up, and we're working on the following month um, for or someone else next month in BSD. I'm not sure. We still have to get the details of that, maybe. But the idea is for this to be informative for you, help you to know what's out there. We're not endorsing any one of these systems by inviting them to come here. Um, this is just kind of a positive exchange for them to 
show you what they're doing and see it in practice and help you uh, decide uh, where your use of BIM and specifications measures up and where things are going. Uh, and we'll, uh, uh, at the end of this, uh, try to have some kind of a summary about the whole process of BIM and specifications and some kind of general discussion after the after we're done with this series. So uh, as Beth said, and I will say it too, now with no further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn the presentation over. Um, uh, Gil or Jim, which one of you wants to be the presenter? I will uh, present, and then we'll uh, move along from there. Is that you, Gil? Uh, yes. Um, OK. All right, I'm going to make you anything much other than and, uh, answering questions with anything that needs some visual aid, but uh, we'll start there anyway. Okay, I'm going to turn the uh, uh, the presentation over to you, and while Gil's getting set up, uh, um, <clears throat> Gil is the um, Chief Technology Officer for eSpecs, um, one of the leading uh, master guide specification authoring systems that's available out there. Uh, and uh, he's uh, the head guru there on everything to do with eSpecs, so we're uh, very privileged to have Gil with us today. Uh, and uh, uh, Gil uh, is joined um, today by Jim. Oh, I just lost my window. Jim, I don't remember your last name. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's uh, Kellogg. Kellogg. Jim Kellogg. Thanks, Jim. Jim's the uh, firm-wide director of best practices for HOK uh, in their San Francisco office. So we're also very privileged to have um, someone from one of the leading firms uh, uh, in the world with us today to talk about how they do things and share their experiences. So. Gil and Jim, thank you very much for joining us, and take it away. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to just have a, a brief overview of some of the things that uh, may not be completely understood with, with these specs, but uh, we'll work towards that. Um, I'm going to try and concentrate on the actual integration, the, the BIM aspects of things, rather than concentrate too much about uh, how eSpec actually generates specifications, so it does that very well. I think this, this, the point of these meetings is a little bit different than just simply generating uh, specifications from CAD systems. Um, but there is really four, maybe more, but I, four, four ways that I know of uh, that an outfit could use eSpecs to integrate uh, their systems to BIM. Uh, the most simple aspect is simply to take external files, which we call project files. Um, there's a list of them here that you can see. But these project files can be anything from uh, submittals, uh, cut sheets of different products. Uh, it could be a warranty from a product. It's any kind of uh, project-related document that has uh, something to do with the specifications, either from a designer or from a project manager, anything like that. And the easiest way to integrate them is just to attach them uh, to an assembly uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the model. So for example, if there's a stair, a steel stair in the project, uh, I can associate you know, the stair details of PDFs or, or nosing detail from the manufacturer of the nosing. And I can attach those to that stair element in the Revit model. And then that can move along with the model and can be reviewed and loaded at any time. Um, that's very popular uh, by contractors. Uh, they'll have uh, generally either a Revit model just uh, given to them or, or relayed to them from the architect. Or in a lot of cases, they'll build their own. And they'll build their models in relationship to constructability rather than towards design, which is actually quite different. But as they're building their model for constructability, they can attach these files, uh, including any specification documents that the architect has sent, PDF or in top version or Word files and so forth, and attach them 
uh, to these elements. And that makes it very easy for them to uh, review them or get them, retrieve them quickly during construction. So if there's any question at all during construction about it, some small element uh, in the Revit model, they can pull up any kind of document that will clarify that, including specifications. So that's sort of the lowest end project uh, files connection there is. There are a number of contractors doing that. There's one uh, right now in Malaysia that's strictly using these specs just to attach their external sections coming from designers to all the elements in Revit. And then they do a similar thing when they move the Revit model over to Navisworks. Navisworks is, uh, if you're not familiar with Navisworks, it's it's a graphic program that allows you to pull in several different types of CAD drawings into one model and tie them all together. So you can have ARCHICAD drawings, AutoCAD drawings, Revit drawings, Bentley system drawings. It really, you know, there's quite a list, some 30 different types of CAD systems that you can use inside of Navisworks. So one of the ways these specs can help them is allow them to attach specification sections and, spe and project files that generally come from one source and attach them to any kind of CAD system that they may be getting drawings from. Um, and so that, that's a very powerful thing for them during construction. The second level is where you are actually using the model during design phase and you're, you're basically establishing uh, materials, let me uh, just load something quickly here, establishing assemblies and materials during design which have an effect immediately on the specification for that project. And this is very cyclative. It's not something intended that in one minute you push the button and voila, you get the spec section. It's not really that, uh, it's not intended to be like that. The workflow is much more cyclative where you have a general uh, approach or, or or uh, early design stage, which might generate an early draft of an outline spec or something like that. And ideas and decisions are made early on at that stage. Um, and how eSpecs really does that is it unites uh, an assembly code from the model, which in, in essence is very, very similar to the CSI uniformat codes. Um, in this case, they're simply codes set up uh, to identify each element of the model individually. Um, and so here, I, you notice I've selected the steel stairs. And what eSpecs allows you to do as a designer or a specifier is to associate the uniformat type codes over to the master format sections as well as the type of products and materials you're looking to include in the project based upon the assemblies in the top left. So that's sort of the second level of integration where you're looking for the model at a higher level stage right? um, to give you information about products and elements based on assemblies. And assemblies are really early on you know, building, I mean, wall types, um, uh, door types, window types, curtain wall types, and things like that, even glazing types. Uh, could be identified. And that's what kicks the ball and gets it all started. Uh, this begins now to formulate a, a really good structured uh, layer of information. Uh, this information is directly related to, of course, the specification section. But more so, it also allows more than just the uh, specifier and designers to take advantage of that information. Uh, we have some cases where, uh, one case for, for uh, example, Canon Design in Buffalo, New York. They're pretty much at this level where they're saying the assemblies from the model can really drive the specification to the point where uh, it's a really well-coordinated set of drawings. And then the specifier can then go at that point and make the final decisions and get that last 10% of custom spec writing uh, into the project. And they then uh, use that list of assemblies for the project 
to also drive an early cost estimate that's done by their cost estimating team. And what they've done is they've created a mapping between the assembly codes used in the Revit model and the uniformat codes that are used in their cost estimating system. Now, it isn't going to bring them to a 100% cost estimate. So what they do is they also use the information from the specification driven by the assembly codes to for further automate their cost data information. And that's simply going from one uh, tag, what we call these tags, so it's going from one tag to an element in their cost data. In this case, I'm showing you that the, the metal pans are directly welded to the stringers. So they may have a figure uh, that's a little bit different than bolting them in their cost data. So this little piece of information then bumps or subtracts uh, from their data. So that is sort of where they are at this point. Um, they're looking to you know, maybe go a little bit further, but at this point, that's the current stage that they are at. Um, the third level of integration has to do with having the specification section feed back to the model uh, much more detailed information. And this occurs in, in actually two ways. It occurs uh, in keynoting lists and annotation lists. If I quickly load uh, keynoting here, you see that there's a list of keynotes for each section, and some of them are checked, some of them are not. So what happens here is as the model is generating elements and assemblies, the sections will drive the keynotes that are required uh, based upon what's included in the section. And these keynotes then are derived from a master set which is established by the spec writing team. So the spec writing team, as they're looking at their office masters and coordinating the different preferences in their master, they're also establishing a master list of keynotes that are appropriately languaged for details or any other uh, CAD elements. And what eSpecs does is just simply create a sublist of that master list for those modelists so that they have a shortened list of keynotes that they can be assured of that are required to be used in the drawings. I found in my history as an architect that the majority of mistakes uh, made in CAD systems is not the wrong selection of elements, is the problem of selecting from too many choices. So what this is doing is selecting, uh, allowing a much smaller list uh, to choose from that will prevent a lot of mistakes down the road. So that is the third level. We have a number of NVBJ is a firm that is uh, up to this level. They have created a workflow where the assembly at the earlier stages of DD uh, in the Revit model, drive the specification draft, also drives the keynotes, and those keynotes then are brought back into the model when different things need to be annotized or noted at whatever stage the project's at. And that, again, is a cyclative process. It doesn't all happen at the beginning, doesn't all happen at the end. It's a continuous flow of information back and forth. Um, here in, in a Revit model, uh, those keynotes are very important, as you can see here in this drawing, um, because whether or not you like to use the section number in front of your annotations irre is irrelevant because Revit can allow you to hide them if you like to, but you know that the language that is on the drawings is identical to the language in the specifications because it's been driven by the spec. Uh, a lot of firms are finding that to be very, very powerful. Um, and also the fact that if these keynotes are changed at any time along the way, Revit has the ability to automatically change those keynotes wherever they appear on a drawing. 
And uh, this is very powerful. Uh, it'll, it really does eliminate many, many silly mistakes that I used to have to deal with myself when we were doing this with pencils. Um, so this is a very, very common way for firms to, to develop their integration. They uh, uh, find that the keynoting is probably one of the best aspects and that they can involve their young people that are mostly modeling um, into learning about how things go together because they're getting the spec writers to really assist them in this collaboration. Okay, the, the last way um, that we are promoting, and this is somewhat, somewhat early at this stage, but we've gotten a lot of calls from contractors that want all of this ability, but they want all of this ability in a program called Navisworks. And so the next level of, and I'll just load that briefly here, the next level of integration with these specs is the complete triangle between contractor, architect, and owner. Um, this is done through cloud computing, as they, the, uh, the key word is there. So at, with a cloud server, what you're able to do is collaborate in, on a three-way triangle. The contractors can view the documents as they're getting built, view the sections as they're getting built, and the owner can also review design decisions and so, and so forth. And the reason they can do this is that they're all collaborating off the same server. And Navisworks is a mechanism or software technology that will allow that to happen. So I'll just briefly show you what this might look like in Navisworks and get you the idea of why this is important for, for contractors. Um, I had a discussion, discussion just a couple of days ago with a contractor who really was you know, very interested in visually seeing the different types of glass on a project. Or he was really interested in seeing where all the different types of external paint were being used on the project. Where was the epoxy paint? Where was the latex paint? And with this type of specification, Navisworks collaboration, you can do that. You can visually see where all these elements are going to go in the model. There's no confusion. Um, and so that's, that's really the next stage of integration. If this will load up here, we'll take a look at that. Are there any, any questions at all at this point? So, Gil, while you're No, I'm going very, one. very fast, but I don't have a whole lot of time. Um, we've got one question that says, if the keynotes are already tied to the families, are you editing that list or creating another list? Very good question. If the families come in with a keynote already attached, what eSpecs will do is verify that keynote. If that keynote is a keynote that's been approved for the project, it simply leaves it. If that keynote is a foreign keynote, in other words, it's, it's not in the specifier's approved the list of keynotes for that project, it will become red. In other words, in Revit, you'll see the keynote in a red color. In eSpecs, you'll see it in a red color as well. That will warn you that the keynote has something inappropriate or inco uncoordinated with it. And it would be a good thing to maybe chase it back and see what, see what the error is. Um, here is the same model loaded in Navisworks. And what I quickly want to show you here is how eSpecs attaches specification information to the elements in this Navisworks model. I just got four of them attached right now, but it's very interesting to see. So if I select the exterior wall cast in place, you see in, in Navisworks that those elements are clearly defined and highlighted in red. That also shows me down below the sections that are a link to the model, as well as you know the project files that we talked about. Uh, if I select something else, then this is the stone veneer that gets so highlighted, as well as insulated glass, steel stairs. Uh, so let's let's do something here to show you how this 
quickly works. I want to I want to see the differences in glass types. So what I'll do is select this piece of glass here, which I know is spandrel glass, and I'll have uh, eSpec synchronize that glass with all the elements uh, in the in the eSpecs database. And what I'm doing now is I'm transferring the information from the architects. Uh, from the architect's specification and model to the contractor's model. And now that he has that synchronized, you'll see that we have a new element in here, which is spandrel glass. And you can see now that there was a couple of pieces of glass here. And what that allows the contractor to do is, is a couple of things. If I select the glazing section, of course, I see the location of all the glass in the project. Uh, and also, if I'd like, let me see here. I can hide, well, I can just hide. Uh, it's okay, I'll, I'll do that some But I could hide everything other than the glazing. So you could see it all in one spot. Okay, but what if I just wanted the individual glass? Then I could just select these parameters and find individual glasses. So here I'm seeing how eSpec, you know, cuts up the information in the glazing section and places it into the different elements within the model. And that's something that really hasn't been able to be done before. You've always had to sort of define on drawings which where is the certain this certain glass type uh, versus glass type two and so forth. And so it's this type of collaboration and integration between models and specs that is really driving right now the, the construction and, and contractors market. So those are four typical scenarios that we've been seeing with eSpec. Uh, Jim Kellogg has a, a very interesting way of doing a similar thing at HOK. Um, I would say at this point they're at the third level of integration where they are using model information to generate the spec, but they're also using keynoting as well. And uh, it's might, it might be a little bit different than I explained to you, but it's also very interesting in how uh, maybe a, a different way that you could use the eSpec keynoting to drive specifications as well. So I'll introduce Jim Kellogg. I've known Jim for years now. We've collaborated on a number of things. Uh, probably one of the most, I would say, influential and acknowledgeable people I know that, that comes when it comes to BIM and coordinating uh, all of the different BIM aspects. And I would uh, I'd suggest that you uh, ask him as many questions as you can get with this time because he is really uh, something special. So, Jim, I would like you, if you would, just to explain briefly how you uh, went about assessing the features in eSpec and which features would work best at HOK and how uh, you you uh, you folks are uh, approaching this whole idea of BIM and coordinated specs and uh, noting and so forth. All right. Thank you, Gil. That's quite an introduction. I'll, I'll see if I can make good on uh, moving forward from the excellent presentation you've offered. Uh, let's see, how can I start on this? Um, first of all, we'll leave your views, the visual part, up. And if we need to, come back uh, in, in, um, to answer questions and follow through with this dialogue. Uh, we can use your model as a, as a tool to show that. Um, all right, what have we done in HUK? First of all, let's see if I can back up a half a step to give a, a broader view of where HUK is going. Um, you, many of you here perhaps know that HOK is dedicated to and part and a, and you know integral partner in um, the group called uh, Building Smart International Alliance, which means a driver uh, to have a partnership between architects, owners, engineers, and contractors to develop um, a evolution is the right way to say it in our industry on how. Um, 
data management and BIM are leading us to uh, down a path of, uh, of uh, expanding the capabilities and the way that data is being shared between those parties on projects. And, you know, Gil, your notion of showing the capability a little bit of the enormous capabilities of uh, Revit and Navisworks are uh, just really interesting and engaging to get people tuned into where this is going. And the uh, one of the interesting sidebars are that if we if we went back five years, which I'm sure everyone here on the call has been in business for more than five years, um, you'd say, "Wow, this this none of this was available five years ago." Some people talked about it as a, a vision of where we might be headed, but um, it it was uh, way out there. And now we're here, and and it does operate. It is in place, and people are continually advancing the way that database management and BIM can be achieved and going into new directions and explorations that people hadn't even imagined five years ago. So come back five years from now and we'll see where we are. And I think it will be um, astounding. All right, so where's HOK going with this? First of all, because of, of our direction of saying building smart international lines is our core driver, we have um, dedicated ourselves to have all of our projects um, done in a BIM atmosphere using Revit as the preferred platform. Um, so we made that conversion. We're at 100% utilization of Revit, which is aimed at a direction of standardization and um, interconnectivity of the data, so that each project is on the same on the same ground. Each project has a methodology that is commonly understood by others who come in and out of that job. Uh, that also yields a database environment that can be shared to teams outside of HOK. So that may be consultants, contractors, owners, and that's the key message of what Building Smart is after. So standardization uh, counts enormously to have, a, in our opinion, successful ways of um, uh, efficiently putting buildings together, exploring possibilities of design, uh, meeting clients' expectations, providing information that can be efficiently shared with others. Without standardization, you don't have it. So what we've developed is a, is a platform that's aiming at uh, specifications being one element among many that are tied to BIM modeling of a project. And that that's a driver that says uh, the opportunity is now here to have a database environment that helps manage standardized specifications within HOK to be able to share that information um, globally from, from office to office and project to project and have it be hopefully seamless. Um, therefore, we are striving to have core information be stored in, you know, eSpecs is a valid uh, tool to help us achieve that goal, both from the point of view of how specifiers uh, put together their, you know, detailed specifications. They're responsible for the actual written product and we would like to have a database environment that helps uh, achieve that goal. I mean, you know, there's many choices, of course, to, to do that. Um, but there aren't as many choices in our mind as an efficient way to link specifications back to Revit BIM models. Um, so the drivers that we've looked at to arrive at our platform or our, our position are, number one, we have chosen Masterworks as the standard platform for specs. Therefore, eSpecs achieves that goal of having the core values built around master specs. That's number one. Number two is it's a advanced way of having database connectivity. Uh, what we've done to achieve that connectivity is say, you know, the way we do our modeling, it all starts or, 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 or is built around uh, families, Revit families. They're the integral components that make up a building parts that are necessary to actually build it from. So what we've developed is a standardized library within HOK of families. That is driven by the idea of standardization. In other words, same, uh, you know, equal parametric structure, equal Revit format, uh, equal level of quality of these elements that all of HOK gets to use as a toolkit to build our designs from. Okay, within the families, it's not just 3D elements, it's uh, um, advanced data that's embedded in these families that are used for a variety of purposes. One of them then is a way to tie that those elements that make up the building back to specs. And we found that through 
research that, that the better way to do this is to say that one tie, one tie point, i.e. assembly codes, is just not sufficient. You know, anyone who's gone through assembly codes or available on Revit realizes how um, short they are in having enough variability to to communicate all of the types of systems, finishes, materials, and the true representation of what you want in a job. You just can't do it with only assembly code. So we agree that, that, a, that a very uh, helpful tool is keynoting as a way to expand the information that originates from assembly codes and yields uh, connectivity to specs. So what we are doing in the bigger picture that I just pointed out, standardization, allow uh, the ability to share information globally around HOK is um, what we've agreed to do is develop a standardized list of keynotes. In other words, it isn't driven always from the uniqueness of a project where the architect or the specifier decide what's appropriate as notations for a project that's initiated from the specs. We think it's driven the other way where it's a standardized list of notes so that the way that, that items are expressed, the way that, no, that um, items are written and abbreviated, the sections that they're tied to are agreed to in advance, and that there is common a text file with keynotes that is uh, globally available for all projects. Therefore, those keynotes are already embedded into our standard families, into the details that support the standard families, so that when you apply them into a model, um, that linkage does not have to be done again and over and over again, it's already done for the team. And it already has that connectivity. It's valuable both in Revit and outside of Revit. You know, you don't necessarily have to have that, that data immediately tied to specifications. But that certainly provides one extra level of uh, BIM in its, in its intent and, it, and, and uh, data in its um, uh, value of having a, a model that completely represents the intent of what's going to be built. So if you leave out specs, you've really lost an important element of, of importance of having a true integrated uh, model. So that's what we're striving for. And we're doing it via keynoting and assembly codes. Um, again, it's, it's the list of the, or the view of the keynotes that are on screen right now is a very good example of a start point of what we're, we are achieving. Um, you know, we know what architectural concrete is, but it also means a lot more in terms of specification information. So therefore, the note that we would apply in HOK that says architectural concrete, I'm not saying that that's the, you know, the only one, the only example to, to use here, but architectural concrete means a lot more in our notation than what it might imply by just reading it on, on a sheet of paper. It's already tied to exactly the specifications that we know that it's intended to mean. And the listing of those notes that are available to users is preset so that they don't have to make it up, do it again, get it wrong, spell it wrong, have it be thought of as meaning one thing when in fact it means something entirely different. They already have a listing of notes that they can apply to their project. So that's the driver. That's, what we're, that's where we're going. And um, keep in mind, that this, the overall database world is advancing so rapidly that, that it would be incorrect to say that this protocol has already been in place for five years and that we have many projects that we can just bring up and show exactly how it's playing. It's, um, it's an evolution that occurs very quickly, but at least we have at this point this structure that's available for our teams. They are applying it. They're finding it to be quite helpful. There are many other little sidebars I suppose we could go back to in Revit. Uh, anyone who here who's, who's uh, uh, been acquainted with Revit and uh, how to use it will say, you know, well, Revit is not necessarily perfection either. There are always issues that pertain to how modeling can be done and the limits that Revit, uh, you, you can definitely push it and find those limits. And then the, the interesting part is that allows us to explore how to solve and, and get around those limits. Um, but uh, it's proving itself to be what it's intended to be. And uh, that's, the, that's the long dissertation I wanted to go into, is, is what we're headed for with in HOK, how that relates to a broader scope of what BIM is intended to be, and how we, we have demonstrated that there's a positive connectivity that we are engaged with to take uh, material that originates from a model and have it directly be connected to specifications.
that's my dialogue for at this point, unless we have questions or issues you'd like to uh, to go into. Fantastic. I, I got a, a one question for you, Jim. The master list of keynotes is that stored in a in a text file that you store somewhere, or is that also part of these specs that's managed in these specs? Or how is that done? It, it is uh, it is a text file that relates to Rabbit, and it also is engaged in part of uh, uh, eSpecs. In other words, you can recover that that keynote list from eSpecs, and you had uh, given a, a quick demonstration of the. Uh, the the um, interchange window that shows uh, the keynotes that are already linked or mapped into eSpec. So you can get it from both directions. But what we're driving for is a master keynote list that's stored in a text file that belongs to Revit. Now, you get into another whole dialogue about, all right, uh, anyone here who's engaged in Revit realizes that keynoting um, is, a, is a, a touchy little business to manage in Revit. Um, it's what's brought forward with Autodesk. That's what we have to work with. And there are mechanisms that you can use to help manage effectively that keynote text file so that all players have access to the same file and that they're not, they're not accidentally overwriting it or destroying the, the values that are embedded in it. What we, what we have done is we've provided a way that you can point to, each user can point to the same text file from multiple locations where typically off of Revit now, if you're just using it out of the box, it gets the text file is buried in people's C drive, and it's very hard to find uh, if you want to go back and build a custom one. Um, so it can be done, and that's what we've achieved. And uh, uh, we're we're really happy with the direction that is taking us at uh, advancing the uh, the capabilities of um, true BIM modeling. So we've got a couple. Are there any any other questions? Open up to other questions that that might. Uh have come up during the discussion? Well, we've a couple questions um, that have been written in. First, did the, did um, your company, no, I lost it, did your company have to create the assembly codes or did you use the ones out of the box? Very good question. And we have debated about that for a considerable amount of time. Um, let's see if I can be succinct at the answer. Uh, what we've concluded is don't think of assembly codes as uniformat because they're not. Uh, there's, uh, they're definitely out of sync. What Autodesk has provided as a uh, standardized list of assembly codes, which they've in, had in place for many years, they're no longer synchronized with true uniformat numbering. So therefore, <clears throat> just break that and say, okay, don't call it uniformat. It's just um, a um, identifier list. It's close. It's formatted in a similar way, the same way as Uniformat. And do we do we want to mess around with making them unique? Well, we found where they where they where they have their text file for assembly codes, and we debated. Well, should we just write a new one? Uh, and and you know we said no because it's it's industry based. Everyone who gets uh, Revit has that same list of assembly codes. Manufacturers who are developing, I'm sure many of you know that that there is a. Um, a, a momentum out there for manufacturers to follow suit with the industry and provide the Revit families, which are truly built, native built in Revit, uh, filled with data, which are very informative. And they want to use assembly codes as one of the mechanisms to identify uh, value in their, in their families. So they're already using the standard assembly code list that Autodesk offers. It would be not great to, to say, well, time to replace the assembly codes, and then it would break that connection for everything else that's been developed across the industry. So we're going to leave them alone. It does no harm because anyone who wants to do, let's say, a cost estimate in a uniformat style, they, yeah, they'll have to do a mapping to take the assembly codes and remap it to correct uniformat, but not so hard to do. Um, a lot harder if you say, we're going to customize our assembly code list and then, and then change the world. But there may be that time, come back five years from now, and maybe Autodesk will follow suit and say it's time to change assembly codes and make it uh, uniformat based. Or to say that, well, you know, there's another parameter that's embedded in, in Revit as a standard value, and that's on the class. And that we might be in a position to say on the class is, is a part of the future, not uh, uniformat numbering. So I don't know if that's a, va a valid answer, but. Uh, assembly codes are very helpful, they're an important tool, and they're something that we've elected to not, you might say, not mess with. 
And I also will add um, that we took at Eastbex the same approach. Uh, we we didn't want to make up our own assembly codes or anything like that. Uh, so we basically started with the assembly codes that Autodesk had come up with for their Revit tool, uh, and we expanded upon it uh, to allow more choices and so forth. Now we tried to stay within the uniform type of uh, classification system. Um, but uh, we really did expand quite a bit and, and took advantage of the last four numbers of those codes. Okay, thank you. We've got a couple more questions. Um, Gil was talking about level one, two, and three of integration. Um, and it says at level three, two subtopics were identified. One was EPEX driving keynotes. What was the other one? Well, the, uh, the model driving the specification uh, as a as a one in, you know a one way. Let me go over them again. The first system, the first method is just simply attaching project files in external sections to elements in the Revit model. That's the first thing. The second one is a one way discussion between the model and the specs, and that is the model drives the specs, and that's where it stops. The third way is not only does the model drive the specification, but then the specification returns back to the model a series of keynoting and annotations that are then used to define the materials in the model. And the fourth was that three-way discussion between contractors and Navisworks, architects and Revit, uh, and owners and whatever tool that they are using. So those are the, the four levels that I see uh, as integration. And then as just Jim said, I mean, it, it could very well change in five years, but currently that's about as far as we can go technology-wise uh, with, what, with what's there for now. Okay, we've got another question that says, does one need to know Revit before using eSpecs? No, absolutely not. What, what one needs to know, however, is the kinds of uh, decisions that need to be made at the specification level and whether or not that project uh, should agree with those decisions. So, for example, in here, the Revit model may send him the requirement for architectural concrete. So the specifier may then say, well, well that sounds pretty fishy to me. Uh, and so there's a discussion that's started around that term. Or, or it's the other way, where the, the, spe the model has generated a series of specifications for the project, but there is nowhere to be seen any architectural concrete, and so there is obviously an omission in the model. So it's really more that you have a series of reports and verification data in your specification system that's validating what the modelers are putting into the model. So you, and you really don't need to have Revit on your desktop. You don't need to have to load it. You don't even have to look at it if you don't want to. Um, it's just a series of reports and information that you can make decisions about. And I found when I was learning eSpecs is you knowing enough about Revit to know the terminology and where um, what an assembly code is and where it lives and what a keynote is and how to place one helped a lot. So not being a master but knowing enough to be dangerous I found really helpful. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, we've got a question of, has, has either of you made external links through HTML? There are places in the master spec sections that do have HTML linkages. Mostly it's in manufacturers. I believe they, they may have, though I may be wrong, I'd have to check on it, but they may have hyperlinks to the ASTM and other standard files as well. Um, I have seen in Revit models uh, hyperlinks to manufacturers from hyperlink parameters that I have seen as well. Um, I'm not sure if I've seen anything more than that. I think that's about as much as they, they go. And let me, let me explain a little bit about that, too. HTML 
is was a very good technology when it when it came out because it allowed us to browse information on the internet. But that information was unstructured information. Uh, it could have been anything from a photograph to a diagram of an automobile. So when XML came out and there are other means of looking at data that was much more structured, HML sort of fell off to the wayside. And when we're dealing with information on the construction level, we need to have structured, like Jim said, we need to have standard structured information uh, in order for computer systems to be able to deal with it. Um, and so you're probably going to see less and less of the HTML linkages occur simply because they're, they're not able to give you enough interaction uh, to make them valuable enough. Jim, have you used any HM, uh, HTML linkages at all in, in your systems? Well, uh, that's a good question. I, not that I'm aware of. I think that it's, it's all URL based. And, uh, we do have HTML material that's available from, from internally HOK's resource library. It uh, can still be very helpful. And what we do include, though, in our Revit standard families is that's one of the key values is where uh, every one of our families will have linkages that will either take people to manufacturer's material or standard of practice that might be applicable or HOK internal information that we wish to communicate as to the base or instructions for use of a certain product. And we've also found, now we're, I guess, really talking Revit here rather than more eSpecs, but I don't see why the same uh, effort can't uh, apply to eSpecs. Uh, you know, directly, if you want to use just eSpecs, not Revit, and you want to have that same connectivity, I'm, I know it can be accomplished. In Revit, yeah, I, we've, we've found a way. You're bringing something to mind. Uh, we yeah, do go ahead and, and, and talk about that. Of, uh, supplementary documentation to master spec. That's very informative. That's like a help right. system for the spec sections. Yeah, I agree. That, that is actually very helpful. We've also found a way in Revit that you can invent, you can place an additional custom parameter that replicates. You know, in Revit, there's a standard URL link that's available for all families. And you can take that and duplicate that uh, parameter and create multiple URL links from the same object. So therefore, you can be pointing to uh, a manufacturer plus internal resource material plus additional support material that might reside uh, in completely other locations. And I would say, I would predict that in five years that Autodesk will probably have that be as a normal protocol within their system. Right now, it's, it's at least a good move forward where you have a single parameter that allows you to immediately place a URL link. Um, that, that's, you know, and also manufacturers, I mentioned that before, manufacturers have definitely come on board to offer from their websites Revit material that's supporting their products, and it's pretty much industry standard that they will, and of course they want to, very common sense, they will provide immediately their link back to that page that represents their product. So you're going to find now that, that it's common ground, that anything off the website will offer those kind of interconnection links. Um, it's where the industry is. Yeah, I would just uh, caution with the HTML that if you're embedding numerous HTML elements into your Revit families, that at some point that server might move, and it could be an awful lot of work to reset all those URLs to the new server locations. So that's that's the other thing that we might want to keep in mind as you're building these. Well. Valid question. That's another sidebar. It doesn't necessarily relate directly to eSpecs, but that's a common issue that's been uh, debated about uh, on material that's offered on the website and how can the manufacturers guarantee that they're not going to you know, move their objects around and then disconnect links they've created before. And I think they know that, and they're um, trying to believe, have a standardized approach where they point to their home base and maybe they don't actually point to a particular page within the base that they know is likely to move two years from now. Uh, but those are, you know, it's kind of, it, it, it's a very interesting environment to be in to see how all this is uh, being uh, invented, uh, produced, um, tested, and then how it evolves. Uh, we're, we're at a very exciting time, actually, in uh, architectural practice. And on that great note, I think we're going to have to end. Um, a very exciting time in architectural practice and 
all aspects of the building industry. Uh, Gil and Jim, thank you very much for sharing your presentation uh, and your thoughts and comments with us. I think it's been uh, very helpful and informative. Beth, I wanted to ask you to comment on how it fit with what you said, but our last month, we'll have to hold off on that uh, because we've arrived at the end of our hour. Uh, I've put up here on the screen, I think you can all see my screen now, emails for Gil and Jim. So if any of you out there want to follow up uh, with them with any questions, I'm sure they won't mind that. Um, and otherwise, uh, we will be back here next month, uh, same time, same place, and we'll be continuing this series uh, with a presentation, uh, as I said, from either PSD or uh, another system, uh, depending on scheduling. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll see you next month.